Well, being the big and loud personality that I am and that I was in that era, um, kind of the head of the of the crowd, um, I the leader of the pack, I should say, I went up and uh, asked the lady at the box office for the tickets and quite surprisingly she just handed them over without any questions and we were obviously taken aback by this and it was quite a, a, a wow factor for us. We were then ushered into the theatre. Uh, a bigger surprise that was led is that we were right in the front. I mean, we was, they seated us a couple of rows, two rows or so from the front of the, of the stage. So we were incredibly taken by all of this. We were all of 14, 13, 14 years old. And it was a huge thing for us in those days. Uh, the show started and a comedian by the name, if I recall, is Dick Capri, he came on stage and he did his gig with all the comedy and, and, uh, and jokes that he spent, which kind of went fly flying over our heads. We weren't in the understanding, we were far too young to understand what any of that humour was about in those days. And before we knew it, there was this loud sort of ladies and gentlemen and orchestra was playing and here comes Tom Jones and we all sat there with our eyes wide open, larger than life and he appeared on stage and he started singing and he started performing the show. We were incredibly enthused by all of this, a little bit confused because there was a lot of lingerie that was being flung over our heads, uh, bras, panties, things like that and we were just uh, far too young to understand what all this was about. Um, clearly they knew, they were giggling and laughing as adults sitting around us, so it's a little bit intimidating, it was then for us at the time, and um, halfway through the show, a gentleman came up to me and tapped me on my shoulder, and I turned around and he looked at me and he said, Mr. Woodward would like to see you in his hotel suite tomorrow afternoon. And I looked at him and I thought, well, you've got the wrong guy, the wrong girl here. But who's at Woodward? I didn't even know what he was talking about. So in moments, this, in seconds, this was just forgotten, done and dusted as I just turned back and continued focusing on the show in front. Um, it was a little bit odd because it felt like he was singing to us. He may not have been, but it was pretty focused. And anyhow, wonderful that it was, the show ended. Uh, we all traipsed out of the theatre and our friend's father that had given us the ride through had come to collect us and we got into the, into the car and as he drove off from the theatre, I opened up my programme and in the bio section of the programme, the words just flashed in my face where it had mentioned that Tom Jones's real name was Thomas Jones Woodward. And the word Woodward just really hit me quite hard. It made me pretty nervous because I thought, why would they want to see me in the hotel room? Or, you know, I was very unsure of what was going on. And I just suddenly put it out of my, I thought to myself, you know what, they had the wrong girl. With all of these women there and all the lingerie being thrown around and they got the wrong person. So I forgot about it. I really did. It was just something that was confirmed in my mind. Anyhow, we all went home. We were dropped off at home and we went to sleep. The next morning on awaking, we did the usual girl thing, phoning each other, calling, you know, all in excitement and we saw the show and it was wonderful and oh wow. And, and in those years, I belonged to a Jewish youth movement, an organization called B'nai Akiva, which um, held meetings every Sunday afternoon at the Shalom Center. The Shalom Center was about a block away from the President Hotel. And this was a youth movement, like uh, anyone that holds on weekends for kids, where you have Bible study and you have games and it's a social get together and meet and greet type of thing for kids of your age. So, of course, we were in our age group. Uh, if I remember correctly, the group was called Roim, which was for 14-year-olds, 13, 14-year-olds. And our game that was <coughs> suggested to us, or basically given to us, to our group of girls, was to find a star. And I suddenly thought, wow, 
okay, well, we saw the show last night and the hotel is a block away. Maybe if we go and get this autograph that we didn't get that day, there we have it, you know, it's a, it, it, it kind of makes sense. Find a star. It was, we thought it was pretty clever. So a couple of us got up and we made that block walk, which was very short. It's a couple of minutes walk. We got into the hotel. It was pretty empty -ish, and went straight up to the concierge and said we'd like to get Tom Jones's autograph. And there was no questions asked. The phone was picked up, a call was made to whomever, and a couple of, we were told to wait in the lobby, and a couple of moments later, the elevator doors opened up, and the bodyguard came walking out, and <clears throat> he looked at the group of us standing there, and he said to my friends, you guys wait here, and he pointed at me, and he said, you come with me. And I followed him, at it was kind of, you know, respect your elders and listen to what they say. I wasn't very comfortable about doing this, but we thought, we're going to get the autograph, okay, fine. It'll be a couple of minutes, how long can this take? So, went into the lift, uh, or the elevator as you call it, and it took us up to the sixth floor. I followed him down a corridor, and he opened up a door, and he led me inside, which was a bedroom of sorts. I wasn't very au fait with hotels and things like that, too much in that, in that time, so... And he said to me, wait over here, and he pointed at one of the, it was like two single beds. And I sat myself perched at the edge of the bed. And within moments, he was trying to pin me down, and he had taken his, he had unzipped his trousers, and he had them down to his knees, exposing himself completely, and trying to basically, what we'd call us in, get it stuck into me. Um, I didn't know what was going on. I was completely frightened. I was struggling. I went into panic mode. I was very, very freaked out. Um, I kept trying to push him off me. And as I mentioned earlier, it really was in a matter of moments. And he, he must have caught on very quickly that I wasn't in a comfortable space and as I was struggling. And he got up immediately. He got up immediately zipping himself up and he went keep calm keep calm it's okay I'll take you through to get this autograph it's fine and he kept muttering and mumbling under his breath kind of um, I'm so sick and tired of this he always gets the good chicks and babbling away a conversation none of this was making sense the only thing I knew was I needed to get an autograph and that was that so outside of having to get the hell out of there <laughs> for sheer fear I just thought take the opportunity and I followed him to another room he had taken me out of that room and opened up another doorway and this doorway had let itself open to a large suite which clearly was indicative of somebody quite important staying there um, because it had a, a living room area, dining room area, facility. It was, you could see, the whole ambiance was different. Um, and there were a couple of other interleading doors out of, in that suite. There were two couches. Um, the couch that was facing me, I recall seeing Dick Capri, the comedian from the, the night performance the night before was sitting there facing me and one of the background vocalists the blossoms was sitting next to him and with her back to me there was a blonde lady sitting on a couch and at an occasional table on the left hand side of entering the room was a pretty plumpish sort of guy but a young guy that was sitting there with brown curly hair and I felt a little bit uncomfortable and we to all these people in there but Dick Capri had a very warm smile and he you know ventured out to me to say do come and sit down and he pointed at the couch opposite him and I went and I sat down and I felt quite intimidated by all these older people around me anyhow and I thought well let's get all brave and I looked at the lady sitting to my right the blonde lady and I thought I'd recognized her from one of our newspaper clippings 
and I asked her, excuse me, are you not Vera Johns, Miss South Africa? And she quite curtly <laughs> turned around and looked at me and she said, no, my dear, I'm Annalyn Creel, Miss World. Well, I just was so embarrassed, I wanted to cringe and climb under a carpet. I didn't know <laughs> what to say or do. I wanted to get the hell out of there. Um, it was quite patronizing and very intimidating, to say the least. But at that moment, uh, Tom Jones walked out of one of the interleading, he came out of one of the interleading rooms. Um, he was wearing a white short dressing gown, a hotel, one of the hotel uh, issue gowns. And he, as he came out of the bedroom, he looked at the young guy sitting at the occasional table and he came out singing, Hey Fatty Boom Boom Sweet Sugar Dumpling. And the guy looked at him and went, Oh, come off it, Dad, kind of thing, you know. So they were having a playful little, clearly a personal session. Um, I was taking all of this in because I thought, Wow, this guy looks quite little next to what we had seen on stage, which was really larger than life. Um, and in those days it was habit to carry little instamatic cameras as today everybody has a smartphone that's got a camera on them. We had our cameras on us, we used to take snapshots everywhere. And I asked, I can't really remember very clearly today who it was, but I, I really am sure it was the young guy, which I, I know today is Mark Woodward, Tom Jones' son. Um, I'm, the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that it was him that took the photos, as memory serves me. And Tom Jones has made his way out onto the balcony, onto the veranda, uh, just to get some fresh air, I suppose. And we followed him out. And a couple of photographs were taken. The first photograph was taken, and I was a little bit nervous and incredibly shy. Um, I know hard to believe being so bolsterous, but... They, at my core, I am quite shy, especially in that kind of company. And I'd, I was holding onto the balustrading, onto the balconies, um, the railings. Um, and he kind of, for the second shot, you can actually see in the photograph, he quite affectionately just put his arm around me and drew him, drew me closer to him. Um, so it led to a moment of a little more comfortability, if anything. So anyhow, the couple of photos were taken and he disappeared back inside. I was standing outside and I thought, okay, well, what now? And all in all, I just didn't feel comfortable at all. So I decided, you know, my heart was just telling me, get out of here. This is not right. This is, you don't know any of these people. They're older than you. They're all these famous kind of people. It just, I, I didn't understand any of this. So my gut was just getting me to get out. And as I made my way towards the door, his son came out of one of the interleading doors and gave a thumbing kind of ac uh, action with his, with his hand, a motion to say, and said to me, my dad would like to see you in here. And I didn't know what in here was, what it was about. I had absolutely no clue his dad and again it was a situation of respect your elders we had grown up with that kind of um, education and you just went yes sir no problem so I went in and clearly it was Tom Jones's private bedroom and I went inside he was wearing his gown and um, he offered me he had a bottle of Dom Perignon champagne. I didn't know what that was at the time. I just saw this glass of bubbly and sparkly, what looked like a soda, um, in a glass. And he said to me, would you, like, would you care for something to drink? And he handed me the glass. And at that age, one feels like, you know, you need to kind of feel a little bit with the crowd sort of thing. So I went, okay, and I took a sip of this and it was the most vile tasting thing I've ever had. I've never tasted alcohol so it was just disgusting. And all I wanted to do was get it down in one gulp, like just get rid of it and get it out of the way, which I did. 
not realizing that I was now drinking alcohol. And at that age, I don't know, it, just, it was the first time in my life. So I gulped it down and he followed with another glass. And he kept telling me how lovely I was and you have such beautiful eyes and I really, really like you. And he carried on with this sort of flirtatiousness. And before I knew it, it was almost like an, an Im immobility had set in already from then. He had me down on the bed and with in, in a one foul swoop, all I knew is that his gown was off and I was wearing a one piece, uh, what we called a boiler suit, a jumpsuit. In those days, he had zipped it down and what had started as being very affectionate and uh, and safe almost I would say um, was suddenly becoming incredibly painful and forceful not comfortable I was very confused I was didn't understand what was going on and I couldn't understand why it was where this pain was coming from it was just beyond me but I was also very numb and I couldn't I found myself that I couldn't move and all I heard repetitively he kept saying to me as he was pinning me down relax relax it won't hurt if you relax those those words have just stuck with me over the years um, I never understood at the time what he was trying to say at all so the other the other memory that I have is that of course today at my age now um, you you learned through life and education has got you to, to a level that you understand people's expressions etc and in those years I was very naive I was very young I'd never been with a guy never French guest I, I didn't know what the term meant and um, I couldn't understand the grimace and at this pained look in his face I, I what I didn't understand or realize is that he was probably climaxing um, but it looked painful and at the same moment that I saw that, I noticed there was a, a lot of blood on the sheets. And I, I hit a moment of complete panic because I thought I had done something wrong. I thought that I had hurt him. I thought that with that look, that expression that he had given. And I, I was so frightened. And I came from a very strict, strict background in that era. My father was very strict with me. Um, everything was very correct in the home and with the family situation, you know, politically correct, so to speak. So I just, all I knew inside of me was I had to get the hell out of this place. I, I, mean, I was I was really starting to hit complete panic. And with that, a moment of clarity just got into my mind and I, my, I came to my senses. And I sat up in one foul swoop and zipped myself up. And I got the hell out of that room. That's all I remember was just f flying out of there. I ran as fast as I could. And as I got out, I remember still flying, going down that corridor and, and feeling that I could feel that the silence. There was nobody around. I went down. I, I left the lobby. It was completely dead quiet. And it, it felt, I felt the loneliness already then that it was encapsulating me. I left the hotel um, to make my way back to the Shalom Center to try and make the end of the meeting and look as normal as possible. Um, and as I got to the street corner, a panic set in. <laughs> and I realized I was supposed to go and get an autograph for this game that we were playing, Find a Star, and I never got this autograph. They're going to question me or what has been going on, where have I been for the last hour, whatever it was. I hit another panic zone. So I did the ridiculous. I turned around and I went back. I went back and this time I didn't even ask any questions. I went straight up to the elevator, walked straight in, pressed number six. I went straight upstairs, knocked on his door and he answered the door himself. There was nobody around and I looked at him and even today I feel that little girl looking up at that older person I looked at and I went may I have your autograph please today I feel like an idiot when I think about it because I mean of what went down um, and he cupped my face affectionately and said of course you can you know he was just very very warm and 
And he went over to a desk and he took some stationery, hotel stationery that was that they always have there, and um, he signed to honour with love, Tom Jones. And I looked at him and I said, can I write you? And he said, of course you can. And he mentioned number one, Rockefeller Plaza, New York, New York. And I still thought confusing, why is he repeating New York, New York twice? I didn't understand any of this. All I knew was like, I was now in a swooning Cinderella mode. Don't know what had happened earlier. All that pain, there was blood. I didn't want him to see it. There was some that was on my boiler suit. And I was just praying that he wasn't going to see this. I, d I just recognized the fact, autograph, that was all that was in my mind. And I, um, I got up and I just walked back out, I went back to the Shalom Center and obviously the meeting was over by that stage and my father was out there, he was waiting to pick me up and give me a ride home and I tried to behave as ordinarily as possible, feeling the inebriation still, feeling the confusion, feeling empty, lonely, vulnerable, not sure what to do, what to say, trying to process what had just happened. Anyhow, and as it would, we landed up back at home and the usual Sunday um, evening after the Nakim, I would get into, as kids, we'd shower at home and, you know, before bedtime. And I had my shower and I walked into my mom's room where we would, this habit would have a dry hair in their room. In those days she had the hair dry in that room. And I sat down drying my hair and my mother walked in and she suddenly looked at me and she said, what the hell happened to you? And I said, why? And she said, look at you. And she was pointing. And I looked down and I was covered in bruises. I was black and blue. I had bruises all over my body, I had bruises all over my groin area, my neck, I had hand imprints on my arm. Um, and I was trying to understand what happened. I, I couldn't. And she looks at me and she just said, if your father sees this, he'll kill you. So I just dried my hair and I went to sleep and I fell into this climatic sleep. <sighs> I was very really frightened of my of my father, of my parents, of correct behaviour in those days. And I went to sleep and I woke up the next day and it was just as if nothing had happened at home. Everything was just brushed under the carpet, nothing was spoken about. I'd, got dressed to school, we were wearing long shirts in those days, that type of thing, so everything was okay, I mean you were well hidden with bruising etc. And I, I told a couple of friends, I was trying to tell them what happened, but it kind of went over their heads, most of them were behaving more in a, in a sense of, oh wow, you met Tom Jones, you got his autograph, oh my god, he kissed you, you're so fortunate, you're so lucky, some of them got jealous, they'd seen me on the balcony, having photographs taken. So, in my mind, I was completely confused as to how to process this. Was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? What actually happened? And it was very difficult for me because <laughs> you couldn't, the, the more I try to speak about it or, t or to, to, to try and explain to anybody, the loss of innocence at that time and to try and make head or tail of what had just happened, nobody would hear me. Nobody would hear me. I was either treated way above and beyond and became the popular girl in the class and, the, and at school. Um, it affected my entire life thereafter um, in, from all aspects. I wrote to him like a bloody idiot, I don't know how many times throughout the year. Um, of course, to no response, to no avail. And I've lived a life with it in my face. You switch on a television, a radio, uh, walk past a bookstore, watch a movie, anything today. He's in the media, he's in my face 24-7. I go shopping and the music is pumped out over the music system in stores. Um, people just relate to this 
invisible person that I've had in my life for well over 30 years since 1976 and it was very difficult I've, I've been stonewalled over all through the years nobody would take the story he was too powerful um, I've eventually tried to get it out with relevant journalists over the years um, it all came to naught because the reality was is that it was a statutory rape. I was under age and they required considerable proof and a reality check on that which meant laying a charge. I was not very comfortable with that um, because I hadn't processed all this information myself and through the years as much as I tried to talk about it and get it out nothing was done. It became a frustrating situation. Um, I eventually spoke to, I was guided to Operation Utri, which apparently is a division um, under Scotland Yard. Um, this was all linked to other people that had their fingers in the pie as well with the story at the time, that today are doing time for this. For example, Max Clifford. Um, Max Clifford had got me to sign a confidentiality clause about 15 years ago, I think. Uh, yeah, exactly, 2000. Um, that I wouldn't speak to the press or to anybody about this. And he didn't communicate with me over the years. Eventually, uh, I was never getting response to any messages, emails, phone calls from him. And uh, when all the news broke through the BBC, particularly regarding Jimmy Savile, Stuart Hall, Rolf Harris, Max Clifford, the whole lot of them, one after another, this was kind of bamboozling me and I kept thinking, why should this guy be so, be so protected? I was just confused and the more I was trying to, so I wrote a letter, to, I wrote a note to Max Clifford to ask and I never got a response, of course not realising that he was at, being questioned for the very same crime. Anyway, eventually I just got aggravated by the entire situation and anger built inside of me um, of which I realized that my whole life I've really been trying to live a road of truth and justice and I've been stonewalled, I've been blocked at speaking about it and it laid down to the simplicity eventually of if I wanted to write the story, my own biography about my own life, I can't do it because it could incriminate people that are out there and the only way I could process anything was by first actually speaking out the truth of what happened in 1976 to me with a famous person, a celebrity. And this should never ever have happened. I think that it, it, it bypasses all respect. I think that the abuse of power that a lot of these men may have used in that era is completely unforgivable. I think that um, they don't realise how it has compounded and destroyed uh, by, by sheer ill effect people's lives because you live a Cinderella syndrome which just isn't there. You don't live real life. You don't know what real life is about. Um, you don't even understand it. That's the one half and the other half is you live a life of silence. You feel more and more that you're being bound to silence. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, you're going to yeah, answer it in the form of, uh, you know, ask the, answer it with a question in it. Um, we, we want now to talk about, you're also, you know, sworn to secrecy by your family. So you want to say about protecting your family. Mm -hmm. And then we also want to talk about a little bit who Max Clifford is. He's a PR, the biggest PR person in the UK. And about <coughs> the instance with the, seeing the biography and the quote. You see Here, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, I'm going to reframe it. Nope. And hand me your water unless you want to sip. Okay. Be careful about uh, the, the, the bling because of the sound. <laughs> if you want to use, use this arm. <laughs> All right, I'm going to zoom back in and I'm going to ask you about why didn't you go to the police in 1976? Why didn't you go 
to the police at all? And have you gone to the police? In 1976, um, especially being at the age of just turned 14, going to the police was something one didn't really do. You kind of went to your friends or your parents first with something like that. And um, I immediately was in a situation of, you know, keep your mouth shut, don't ever mention this, don't embarrass the family, you know, protect the family, that type of thing. So that was on the one hand. And on the other hand, those that I'd called out to help, um, the police was not something that, that one would have, have thought about then. You were too young. We didn't understand it. At 14 years old, in Cape Town. we just didn't understand it. We were living in Seapoint, Cape Town, South Africa. It's a village. It's tiny. Everybody knows one another. And it's not something that is that uh, <laughs> spoken about. You kind of just keep your own privacy and respect that. So in the hope that things are just going to go away and that you're not going to think about it again, which clearly, of course, doesn't happen. The can of worms does open. And it did for me particularly when I was going through some therapy. I was in New York uh, around 1999, 2000. And... I had left a psychoanalyst that I was seeing um, and I had gone past a Barnes & Noble bookstore and they had, they had a launch of a book called Tom Jones Close-Up that I walked in and I purchased being interested to see what else is going, you know, in the hope that maybe girls are coming forward, people are talking about it, every biography or autobiography, I, that I, there was nothing in there. And I kept thinking, this is, am I the only one? Can this be possible? It can't be possible. It's not. It. So I read the book. And anyway, halfway through reading the book, I came across a clause. And it was a quote that was um, taken off of him. That he had mentioned, he doesn't know what the fuss is about with all of this uh, uh, stuff. It's not as if that he, he was having sex with children, with kids or sheep. And I took incredible offence to that. First of all, how dare he compare me as a young girl to a sheep? And was he doing the masses? It was just a quote that left me with a very bitter taste in my mouth. And I actually responded to the authors, the biographers of the book. And I said to them, I mentioned to them, that they should get their, right, their correct information. Um, because this happened to me. They wanted to even write a story about what had happened with me and they couldn't do it because in fear of being silenced through his celebrityhood and his status. It was just not possible. So I landed up living with this and... So um, you had told me a line and I'm going to have you say it on camera. It came out of you where uh, you said... I, I'm certainly not a sheep, but I was a child. Absolutely. Uh, go ahead. Absolutely, 100%. I was 14 years old. I was a child. I was no sheep. And if, if that is at an understanding today of how he looked upon us then, that is absolutely disgraceful. That, that, that is, I, I resent that. I find it completely insulting. Um, it, it's, it is below any level of respect that somebody of his status should be holding. Okay, I want you to now explain uh, that you explain just briefly that Max Clifford was a PR guy and that, you know, when that fell through and he actually ended up in jail, you did go to Interpol, you went to Scotland Yard, they tossed it back. Do the just quick timeline how you actually did due diligence when you were old enough and you'd lost some fear. Um, the story that I've been trying to tell over the years, from the beginning, was whether it was through gaining sympathy from friends and getting assistance and guidance um, and the, the correct manner of carrying things throughout, which continuously landed up to zero. Eventually, when I was of age, I was kind of in my 40s, and I realized all of this... Uh, there was a lot of child abuse scenarios that were coming out in the press and in the media. And I had started writing to a lot of people. I was trying to break the story. I was trying to get assistance. And I was asking them for guidance as into how can we get this 
out as part of because it's all linked. And Max Clifford at the time was one of the biggest publicists in in the UK um, and a very powerful man. And he had a gentleman working for him, Phil Hall, who had worked for News of the World. And he had gotten Phil Hall to discuss with me the opportunities. And clearly I remember the words is, we'll take this on, but you need to sign the confidentiality clause and then so that it doesn't go anywhere else. So these situations came up. And when I saw that it was coming to nil, I started approaching um, some other people. It didn't really much, a lot did not come from my end. Friends of mine were also trying to assist. And eventually it got to the ears of Sarah Whitehead, who is, uh, I believe, Chief Editor of Sky News, who guided me um, very correctly to Scotland Yard and Operation Nutri, of which I did. Scotland Yard, I, I handed them the case. I said that I would like to, um, to officially lay the charge. They said they could do nothing about it. It kept bouncing back at me for the reason that the the situ the, the event had occurred in in South Africa, so it was out of their boundaries. They told me, and they can only do something once. I've laid a charge in South Africa. I was also incredibly protective of my parents. I was incredibly protective of the family. We'd lived a long time with all of this under the rug. It was a lot of pain that I was living through emotionally every time. It, his name appeared or came out, um, you know, it kind of it takes your whole day away from you. And this is on almost every day of the year, there was something new. So eventually I took it in hand where I um, went, I was, I was asked by a South African uh, filmmaker that they were interested in possibly taking this on to do a documentary about, about all of this. And they interviewed me, an attorney and the filmmaker. And when I kept emailing or calling to ask them a couple of questions about what they intended to do, I didn't get any responses. And I felt again, I'm being blocked. I just, again, I'm being blocked. Nobody's getting back to me. They're ignoring me. They're not speaking with me. Nobody's returning my calls, my emails, absolutely nothing. And I really got angry. And I thought, you know what? I need to actually go to the police. And I went to the police. And I had been a couple of times before over the years. The problem was is that in South Africa, a country which I'm passionate about, we're a little bit slow on the uptake when it comes to the law, or we were in those days. And I was kind of shunted out. They didn't understand why you're laying a charge now that should have been done in 1976. It was... That we're a little bit confused, so I, had, I, I kept to be. I was asked to leave the station. Nobody took me seriously, and I had met up with a captain not too long ago um, of one police station, and I called him and I said to him, "I really need to lay this charge, and I'll explain to you what it's about," which I did, and he very kindly offered to meet with me at a police station in the district of Seapoint, of which it happened, and he took the charge. He formally laid the charge in his office in Hart Bay to ensure that a case would be laid with a case number, and formally so, and then he transferred it to the Seapoint Police Office. And now it has been shifted up to the National Prosecution Office in South Africa. Um, I've been questioned by detectives, they've taken statements um, from me and relevant people that they needed to. Um, and they have the case sitting with them. It's a very difficult journey for me, but what it has done is it's enlightened me to the fact that these celebrities are not gods. They are just as human as you are. At the end of the day, we platform them. It's our money that purchases their CDs, their magazines, anything that's in the media about them. We, we as the fans are there that are basically pivoting them up and rocketing them to the positions that they're at. Yes, they've got fabulous voices. And I say they, you know, I've been in one instance, this happened to me with Tom Jones. It has clearly happened with others. Um, and I just feel that 
the education out there, especially in today's world, is critical that kids today need to understand rape is not just something that is created in a harmful physical nature initially. It can be very easily created by mental and mind manipulation where as an adult you know what control and power you have over a child. You, you understand the position that you're in from a celebrity status point of view and it's very easy to just snap your fingers and get what you want. It really is. It's very difficult for a kid of 14 to consent to anything. I, don't, I personally don't believe there's anything that you can say is consensual at the age of 14. I think that's nonsense. So, uh, going back to the actual incident, um, tell us about uh, your feelings of if, if your body is resisting, how is it? Well, that is why I mentioned consensual, because if one is consensual, I wouldn't be resisting. He clearly knew the moment um, that he was that he was trying to penetrate me, he was pinning me down, that I was resisting. He would never have kept repeating himself, relax, relax, it's not going to hurt if you relax. Why would he keep saying those words if I'm, in, if I'm in an okay frame of mind? I clearly wasn't. So from an adult point of view, ideally what he should have done was just back off. And he didn't. He continued until he'd had his fun of games with it at the end of the day. And... It's something that one, one can only recognize and learn through education, through being exposed uh, with something like that. And I really do hope and pray that the kids today, they look up to their pop idols, whoever they may be, um, and nothing much has changed. Nothing much has changed. I think that it's very important for... for and, and I think celebrities today do, do do this. A lot of them do do this in, in today's years. But we need to compound it and get more of them on the bandwagon to understand the relevancy and the importance of respect for your fan club out there, for the people that are actually platforming you, and certainly not go into situations of abuse of power. Definitely not. Okay, core pause it. We're going to just do a quick pause.